as program manager. Our next presentation looks at developing and procuring wood products from tribally managed forests. Uh, just a reminder again, if you run into any issues during the session or have any questions about the conference, please email the address that's pinned in the chat box, tina at wahconservationaction.org. Uh, you can also use the chat box to send messages, but keep in mind that any messages will be visible to all attendees. Uh, if you'd like to submit any questions to the speakers, please use the Q&A feature, which you can access uh, in your toolbar at the bottom of your webinar screen. Uh, we will be sorting through the questions and presenting to the speakers at the end of our presentation today. Uh, and if you're just joining us, you may not have heard it, but the rest of us uh, are already aware. The session is being recorded and will be shared with all participants at a later date. So the first day of our conference, we heard from small forest landowners on the challenges and opportunities of managing Pacific Northwest forests. And on our second day, we learned about analysis showing how different forest management practices provide benefits in terms of climate and wood products, along with all the different values uh, that they provide, uh, all the way down to the end route uh, to the end users. So we are uh, really thrilled to have a, an excellent panel representing the entire process uh, from forest management all the way to end product. Uh, and please allow me to, to introduce our speakers. Uh, Ryan Sanchi is the forest operation manager for the Confederated Bands and Tribes of the Yakima Nation Tribal Forestry Program and has extensive knowledge in forestry and wildland fire. As the forest operations manager, he oversees the planning and administration of the fee lands, collaborates with other agencies regarding forest management within Yakima Nation ceded lands, works on Yakima Nation's Tribal Forest Protections Acts, and 638 contracts with the U.S. Forest Service. Ryan has previously worked as a timber sale officer for five years with the Bureau of Indian Affairs and as an assistant fire management officer for Yakima Nation fire management for nine years where he completed technical fire management 25. During his wildland fire career, he obtained certification as a prescribed fire burn boss two and incident commander three, and has experience as an interim fuels manager. Uh, also with us is Brad Rodakowski. He's the president of Prime Forest Products. He has over 40 years of experience growing up with a father in the industry. Brad is the second generation, having worked his way up through the lumberyard to being the owner of a successful company. He is committed to creating a solid foundation for the next generation of lumber professionals. And Brad loves spending time with his family as well as outdoor activities such as hunting, fishing, and adventures with his sidekick, Timber. Uh, and, and finally, we have Steve Rigdon, who will uh, be hopping on shortly. He's the general manager of Yakima Forest Products, and a, which is an SFI certified operation wholly owned by the Yakima Nation and is a former Yakima firefighter. So we will start uh, with Ryan's presentation. Uh, Ryan, I will hand it off to you when you're ready. All righty. All right, is my screen displaying? Uh, we can see the the PowerPoint, but it's not in presentation. Okay. Hi, my name is Ryan Sanchi. Um, I work for the Yakima Nation. Um, I'm a forest operations manager, and so <clears throat> the Yakima Nation, um, compared to Washington State. Um, reservations down the south central part of the of the state um it has seated areas which are uh usual in the custom rights to hunt fish and gather is about 14 million acres goes from the north part of chelan county almost to canada there clear down to the columbia river to the south um it's made up of 14 tribes and bands approximately 11,000 members um, was formed under the Treaty of 1855. Um, we're a federally recognized tribe and a sovereign nation. Um, the reservation is about 1.4 million acres, has about 650,000 acres of forest. Um, the forest provides for both natural resources and cultural services to the Yakima people. Um, and within the forest, 
uh, on the reservation, the management um, is done kind of is two tiered. There's the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs branch of forestry on one side, and then the, the Yakima Nation Department of Natural Resources kind of on the other. And then I fall under the Yakima Tribal Forestry there. Um, under Tribal Forestry, we have our uh, fee lands and off reservation. Uh, track D as a portion of the southwest corner of the reservation, kind of the Glenwood area. Um, and we have a recreation area uh, that's open to the public. The rest of the reservation is closed to the public. Um, kind of our forest management, the history on the Yakima. Um, 1925 was the first commercial timber harvest. It was the first sale. There was a pine butterfly outbreak. And then 1942 was the first timber management plan here on the Yakima. Uh, 1991, um, our forest development program started. And it was the first 638 contract in forestry that allowed uh, the Yakima to contract the work of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And then later in the 90s, uh, that's when Yakima Forest Products got started, started a small mill and a large diameter mill in 02. Um, and then the tribe decided to 638 the fuels management in 02. And then in 2005 was the next updated and the most recent forest management plan uh, was developed and passed by Tribal Council. 2007, um, fire management was also 638. So the uh, Yakima Nation contracted to do the functions and jobs of the Bureau of Indian Affairs on the Yakima Reservation. Um, in 2012, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, we are uh, Sustainable Forestry, Forestry Initiative certified. Um, we are SFI'd, uh, we do yearly audits and maintain our certification. Um, in 2021, a couple years ago, we started uh, revising our forest management plan. Um, kind of the forest is broken into few parts. The green part there, um, the 650,000 acres is the forested area. Then you see the agriculture is the lower valley, a lot of farming. That's where uh, most of the municipalities and towns are at. And then that brown in the center there is kind of a range area. So this is the forested area. As you can see, um, we have uh, done a LIDAR flight. We have mapped every single one of our trees. Um, within our forest management plan, there's kind of six areas or priority categories that we manage for our cultural and historic. Um, that's our foods and medicines and water quality is a high importance, like clean, clear water, uh, good water for our fish and our forest health. Um, fisheries and wildlife, old growth, and then for revenue and employment. Um, this is the the forest that is managed in a, a few separate parts. We have our um, general forest, um, so it's kind of managed mainly for commercial and uh, forest health. Then we have different canyons, safety corridors, uh, wildlife areas, track D. Um, alpine areas, and then primitive area, which is kind of like a wilderness area, and traditional use areas. Um, one of the issues we've had here at the Yakima, um, here's kind of a map of our slopes, the slopes, and we've had uh, areas that we haven't got to manage for a while, and then with slope and a lot of heavy dead and down, dead fuels, we started picking up large-scale fires. Um, this is in 2013, we had our mile marker 28 fire. It was about 26,000 acres with 19,000 being on the Yakima Reservation. And a few years later, in 2015, we had our Cougar Creek fire. Um, we had 47,000 acres on the reservation. Um, lost hundreds of millions of board feet. Uh, a lot of old growth timber. It was a pretty devastating fire. So since that time, um, we have used, I mentioned that we did the LIDAR. We um, used our data to come up with the fire risk model um, and find out areas of high risk on the reservation to, to destruct a fire. Um, and then we modeled our, our areas, um, trying to get uh, restore our lands from the overstocked uh, pre-suppression or overstocked suppression stands to pre-suppression stands. Um, we tried to use a commercial harvest to uh, as phase one to start to rest, do restoration on our lands. Um, so we're trying to use that um, to mimic fire on phase one, the commercial. 
And then we follow up with our uh, our fuels crew and we do a lot of fuels treatments, um, lots of thinning, piling, burn the piles. And then after um, that phase is done, we try to come up with in with a broadcast burn. Um, the broadcast burns, reintroduction of fire, um, the benefits of fire and also fire resiliency. Um, it's a way we're trying to slowly get it, lands back to resilient and restore them um, to pre-suppression days. Um, here's a little video. We did a cultural burn in an area called our starvation flats, um, where we try to enhance. Uh, it's been pretty stagnant from um, invasive species and grasses, and we're trying to increase the uh, the roots and other uh, foods in the meadows. Hopefully the video plays and you guys can see it. It's taken from a drone. So our fisheries program has also been doing a lot of work in these meadows to try to increase the water uh, table there. Um, we've got conifer encroachment. You can see them there in the meadow. We're trying to maybe burn and, and remove a lot of the conifers. And then also um, help enhance the foods. And then with our fisheries program, increasing the water table, hopefully it um, helps downstream for water supply for fish later in the season and in the meadow for different camas and other um, medicines and foods. The end of my video. So this is post post burn. Um, you see the canvas and everything came in really nice. Um, and that's the end of my section. Now I'll hand it back. Yes. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, we're going to jump into a little bit of Q&A about the management uh, while we uh, queue up the next presentations. Uh, so you, you, Ryan, you touched a little bit on um, uh, increased risk of disturbance like wildfire in particular. Um, have there been specific strategies that you have adopted or, or that have worked particularly well for you? Uh, on um, on strategies for? Uh, sorry, forest management strategies uh, over, over the, the decades uh, to improve wildfire resilience. Oh, yeah, yeah. So like I kind of stated, um, we kind of go in with mechanical treatment first, um, kind of break the overstory up. Um, we try to go back to model um, pre-suppression days. We found out what the forest was, and then we're working to get it back there. Um, we can't do it all in one big, quick shot. You know, 650,000 acres, it's going to take um, several years. But um, so we're trying to increase uh, scale. We just basically want to enter enter um, with the uh, machines to reduce the risk and remove all the fiber that we can and not put it into the atmosphere. If we can take that fiber, um, work with the Acma Forest products, you know, they, you know, sell the, the timber cells to them. They, they use it to manufacture boards, but we come in and then we um, reintroduce fire. Um, and that way, when we, we do that first entry of fire, we kind of got uh, some fuels treatments done to reduce the intensity of the fire. So we got more natural fire back on the landscape. And then it seems like, at, and then we try to do a maintenance burn about every 10, 15 years after. It seems um, places that we've uh, accomplished this when we've had wildfires, fire intensity was really uh, low. Surface fires had really good fire effects. Um, uh, we Hopefully we can get to a point in time one day where, where we don't have to suppress our wildfires because the lands, you know, resilient to them and we'll just hit the natural buffers um we're working with our fisheries department and trying to get our a lot of our drainages to be more like sponges and less like wicks so that way you know, they'll check up the fires and have as the natural um barriers that had two three hundred years ago hopefully that answered your question you're on mute brian thank you uh, this question is from Savannah Reed. A previous presenter mentioned that larger pieces of slash are better for soil health because they have a favorable carbon to nitrogen ratio. 
Is there a sweet spot in size of slash pieces that balances the need to reduce fuels while also improving soil health? Uh, yes. <laughs> and no. Um, I, a lot of it depends on, on where you're at. Um, on some of the east, you know, we're, some of our forests are pretty far east. You know, they'll go from the 12,000 feet at the top of Matt Adams on the crest of the Cascades and goes all the way east to basically what you call the desert lands. So um, we have uh, a little more slash and larger slash is better farther west on our forest. Farther east where it takes a long time for things to break down and decompose, probably smaller slash and smaller pieces are probably better. So more price site specific. Thank you. Uh, so you you um, mentioned that uh, you had en you'd entered into your first forest stewardship agreement with the Forest Service uh, about eight years ago. Uh, can you talk through some of the challenges of reaching that agreement um, in general? Uh, yeah. Um, so it, within the seeded area, um, we uh, have the Okanagan Natchee National Forest to the north of us. Um, and we have been on a lot of collaboratives, worked with the Little Natchez Working Group, uh, the, the Posh um, Collaborative, and and slowly worked between all the groups. And we've done our first uh, Tribal Forestry Protection Act, um, where we did got uh, under the 2016 Farm Bill, I think was the first one. And then the 2018 Farm Bill, we did another one um, where the, uh, the tribe basically... Uh, got a stewardship cell with the with the forest service and then we implemented all the stewardship projects and and then all the commercial wood went to uh, yakima forest products there in white swan and then right now currently we are working on a uh, 638 contract to do um an a to z on the okanagan wenatchee on a forest vegetation project um called south fork titan um, right now we are in the process of doing the nipa Some, and and from some or any one of those product uh, projects, uh, what benefits or uh, anticipated benefits have you seen? Um, so with the Okanagan Natchee on the um, we, through the collaboratives, we have uh, helped them do uh, the, uh, some huckleberry enhancement on a cell called Huck and Finn, <laughs> and um, so the actually the target on the forest was was less just forest health and more for um, foods like huckleberries so it was actually harvested a little heavier than the forest normally does but um through the process of explaining the importance of of the huckleberry the yakimas and being in a traditional use area um that that was a factor that was actually the uh, benefit and so versus uh retention of trees more of uh, you know in this these stands the huckleberry like a little more open stand so actually lower the basal area a little bit and and so then i think um Boise Cascade actually bought the timber cell, so that went to a, another um, a mill, and uh, and then also the fire risk and and uh, closer to uh, less risk to uh, stand replacement fire. Thank you. Um, shifting gears just a little bit, uh, do you feel the uh, the market rewards Yakima Nation's management practices either in terms of uh, better prices for your wood, uh, or access to markets, or some other addition? Well, I can only speak from uh, the side of the landowner side. And uh, in that, um, through the SFI and being green certified, and um, us really taking care of our uh, our resources, protecting our water and our um, endangered species and our wildlife habitat, um, I, I think it, it gives the opportunity for um, Yakima Forest products to um, hopefully um, market that wood and get higher prices for the way we manage our land. But um, that's a question for, for Steve. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, unfortunately, we got to keep moving along so that we can get through all of the presentations. Uh, so next we have uh, Brad Rodakowski who is the president of Prime Forest Products. Um, there you go. Uh, let's see here. Start video. What's going on here, Luke? Hang on a second here. There we go. 
There we go. <laughs> Got my, got my tech guy here help me out. Okay. Okay, here we go. Okay. I wonder why the, there we go. Okay, can you guys hear me all right? We can hear you great. Uh, your presentation is still in uh, power in the PowerPoint editing mode. Okay, hang on just a second. I'll get that. Put me on the spot here. Okay. Um, there we go. Okay, is so that working now? Uh, it, it's gone back to the editing mode. Editing mode. Okay. It looks full screen on my end here. But bear with me a minute. Um, okay. Huh. Here. It'll be right there. Let's... Okay. Be building a bath matter. Still in that mode, huh? Yeah, uh, if, if you can't get it in another mode, I, I think we can make this work as well. Okay. All right. So, um, so yeah, I'm Brad with Prime Forest Products. Uh, Yakima Forest Products has been a key supplier to us for 15 years. Um, so they're very important to our success as a company. Let's see. How do I change the screen here real quick? Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, Bear with me a minute. I'm trying to get this started here. Sorry for the uh, errors here. Um, okay, so um, we share what we do as a company with the Yakima, um, and part of what we're doing here um, is our relationships with them. So we really focus heavily on our supply side almost more so than we do on the customer side because without Yakima or the mills then we're not in business and so what we do is we um are what you call a secondary remanufacturing uh, company where we will take the wood um from the mills and we will further process it for particular customers this one here with Yakima, what we do is we supply lumber to a company called Velux in South Carolina. They're uh, uh, based out of Denmark over in Europe. Um, they asked if I could help them source wood here in North America. And so in doing so, <clears throat> I was able to build a relationship with the Yakima tribe because they have the Ponderosa pine. They really like it because of the high altitude growth of the timber. Um, and it's that better texture. So it mills better through the machine center to get a better recovery. Um, <clears throat> so it's been very, uh, it's been very successful in that regard. Um, so part of that is when somebody asks a question about certification, does that get you into some other markets that do not? In our situation, it sure does. So us as a company, we're real big on sustainability. And so we are that SFI certification, the PFC that Yakima supplies with that. We're able to take that to our customer in South Carolina, BLEX, because everything they 
buy has to be part of this certification lumber. Um, <clears throat> with that, they've also asked us to be part of the CDP, which is the carbon disclosure project out of the United Kingdom. And so for us to fall in this arena, we also have to make sure that we handle all of our wood is being certified. And so out of Yakima, they become a very important supplier of us on that certified wood. So it's been able to get us into some other markets where non-certified wood cannot penetrate. So part of that is that long-term uh, relationship. And so here is <clears throat> a picture of some of the members there within Yakima at Bedlux there in South Carolina, looking at the computer, it's a scanner, as we take the wood and put it through a molder to size it, and then we chop it, and they will physically make skylights out of it. And out of that lumber coming off the tribe, it goes to South Carolina from there, it goes to North America market, New Zealand, Australia, and Japan. And they make 100% skylights out of this particular factory. So as you can see, here are some boxes that's ready for shipment. Um, so basically, it's kind of a global supply here that comes off the Yakima tribe uh, and that is serviced out there. Because of the quality of wood that they have, the way that they manage their forest, it has really made our business grow with this particular customer. Um, <clears throat> So long-term relationship is important with us. As you in the lumber business, things are done on a handshake. We don't do these real long, drawn-out contracts. So your word is your word. Um, the sustainability is very important to us. Um, and so is the relationship with Yakima. So we've been doing it for, like I said, 10, 15 years. I think we're going to be in there for a long-term relationship with them. So they're very important to us. Um, the other thing that we do <clears throat> is we keep track of how much board footage we buy from Yakima every year. In return, we give them a check the next year based on so that they can plant twice as many trees that we consume board footage wise from them. So that sustainability is there for the next generation. Um, and I think we're the only company out there that is doing this with anybody. With us as a company, we do it for Oregon Forestry Department. We do it with Yakima Tribe. We do it with British Columbia because that's basically where the bulk of our wood comes from. We've even done some in Vermont. We've done some Eastern White Pine back there. Again, as a company, we try to give back to reforestation um, and contribute to that fund so that we can have lumber for the next generations so it's really it's really really important to us um so this is a picture here of uh yakima's lumber they're at Velux in their warehouse as you can see they are heavily committed to what yakima does so they've been really important for our our market and as as the markets go up and down there's different things you can make out of the log maybe to get some extra money and the times are really good. Um, <clears throat> but when the market drops, there's things that you have a hard time trying to make some product out of that log to make it go away. The thing is about Velux and what Prime does for Yakima is we're there, we are there with them every month, year round. And it's been like that for, for a good decade. So we want to continue that strong relationship. And that's it on my presentation. Are there any questions? Yeah, thank you so much, Brad. Uh, we have a, a couple of questions coming in um, and a couple of that we got sent. Um, what factors do you consider uh, or prioritize uh, in wood procurement? Uh, are you hearing new questions or requests from your customers regarding climate change, uh, or the origin of your wood products? Um, so, so they, as far as the climate change, everybody is aware of it. They really want to make sure that what we supply them as far as raw material, that it is coming from a well-managed force. So it'll be there for, again, generations, not decades, but generations. So we really try to focus on that. 
Um, I think everybody here in North America, for the most part, really tries to manage their forest correctly and accordingly. Um, but yeah, so so as far as the climate change, we're all concerned about it. Is it a natural thing? I think human might be help speeding it up a little bit, but I still think it's kind of a natural cycle that the world just goes through. So we're trying to adjust accordingly. Um, and, and again, by doing that, we're trying to make sure we give back some money so they can plant twice as many trees as what we use to, to run our business from that particular region every year. And I don't know another company that is doing that. So it, it's a feel good thing. Sustainability is is a really big part of our overall company. We think by us giving back, it's that it's it's going to carry on, and other people are going to hear about it, and they're going to want to do business with us versus somebody else that doesn't get back to our our industry. Absolutely. Uh, and can you would you mind expanding a little bit? Um, you talked sort of about what influences your decision to do replanting. Uh, how have you made that operable? Um, <clears throat> well, we have a formula um, and and um, our sustainability person that works in the company, we have a department that does that. Um, and as we're sitting here as a group and we're talking about, God, what can we do differently to give back to our industry, you know, and all of us did a round table session and talked about why don't we, why don't we do a field trip and see what it takes to take a pine cone to a seedling to the greenhouse to physically take it out in the woods and plant it. So I took the whole company as a group and we went out and did that process. And then we're thinking, okay, so it's great. We have a much better understanding what the process is, what can we do to give back? And so why don't we keep track of how much board footage we go through as a company, break it out in the regions where we're getting that wood, keep track of it. And then what does it cost Yakima forest products to plant a tree versus the Oregon state forestry to plant a tree and then calculate that and then take X amount of dollars and give it back to them. So that's what we we've done last year. We gave Yakima a check for twenty four thousand dollars for for planting for planting trees. So it's it's something we've done here as a company as a group, um, and I try to keep everybody engaged to build a really good culture that everybody's involvement and voices are heard. And so that's how we uh, that's how we came up with what we have. Thank you. Uh, we uh, we have a couple more questions, but we are running out of time. Uh, so I'm going to finish with one last question before we move on. Um, how is climate change, uh, you mentioned it a little bit, that, that it comes up often, but how is climate change factored into your long-term plans for sourcing wood products? Well, that's a really good question. So uh, climate change, you know, I think a lot of it goes back to how well the forest is managed. Okay. I think Yakima does a superior job managing their forest more so than the federal does. The federal timber, you know, when Clinton was in office, he made it that nobody's going to log any more federal land. Well, since then, with nobody going in there and thinning out these forests, we're having these really hot, massive fires. And so until our administration wakes up and realizes that there's a resource here that can help out in so many different ways, we need to look at remanaging it. So I don't think anybody's really quite grasped that yet in DC, um, but we we monitor it here. And again, we just try to do our best to spread the word and try to help people manage their force in a better way. Thank you so much. Thanks for taking the time to present and to answer some questions. I think we're gonna roll, roll on to uh, Steve now. So, uh, if he is there. I am here. Great. So I, I introduced you before you, you uh, hopped on, but Steve uh, is the general manager of Yakima Forest Products and SFI certified operation wholly owned by the Yakima Nation. Uh, and he's a former Yakima firefighter. And Steve, I will uh, hand it over to you. Okay, um, 
did Christy have a chance to speak or go over the PowerPoint? Uh, she did not. Okay. I will do that then. Um, do I have the ability to share my screen? Yep. If you uh, click the shared screen button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Okay. I will do that. I'm just setting up. Um, want to apologize to everybody. Um, I uh, just literally came from another presentation um, down here uh, at Sun River near Bend, Oregon. Um, going over tribal um, collaborations. And so, um, again, now I'm here. So jumping from place to place, apologize. But as we're talking about carbon and there's um, the carbon fluxes and the carbon inputs and outputs and how the Yakima Nation, how Yakima Forest products inter plays with that is, uh, you know, due to the fires, due to the smoke to the bear, there's definitely a lot more carbon um, in our forest. It's just in a, a different state. There's a lot more smaller trees. Um, our people have been managing our, our carbon um, influxes and outfluxes uh, for millennia. And um, now we're doing our best to manage that as we can with um, fuel reduction, timber cells, um, and our activities that way. So this just gives a, a slide of our history. And so this is a 1930. Um, we we're more of a pan savannah, savannah type forest, Eastern Cascades. Um, we've had a lot of in-growth of um, shade tolerant species with Douglas fir, Grand fir. Um, but in the 1990s and 2000s, we had spruce budworm and uh, mountain park pine bark beetle outbreaks that um, we treated. And so we took a lot of our carbon. I think we're up above 12 billion with a B board feed of um, standing inventory. Now we're back down to about the 8 billion with the B um, timber uh, standing volume and about 5.5 about that is commercially harvestable. One thing that we do as the carbons do come in, in and out of our environment um, we do a lot of restoration work. And so there's um, encroachment into our meadows, into our wetlands, and, you know, trying to be careful with our logging equipment. How do we go in there and bring back fire? How do we go in there and, and treat it, make it more resilient? How do we get more ladder water um, into the landscape and where we've done that for our huckleberries, for our root grounds on starvation flats. And then also in floodplain restoration work, um, you know, pulling out trees uh, with the root wads and working with our tribal forestry program and our fisheries program, um, been able to, you know, restore a lot of these landscapes that have been impacted due to, you know, floodplain management or lack of management um, and fisheries habitat, you know, in the past, they would pull out a lot of the, the debris out of the streams and getting that um, debris put back in there so it stays and so that our the fish and the other aquatics have their habitat and their places to rest and sanctuaries um, you know, to thrive in. One of the other things as we think about you know, carbon and people, um, we have to educate our future. And so we've been doing a lot of workforce development, youth crews, they've been um, out in our timber cells, um, you know, doing their part to pull weeds. One of our practices, we don't use herbicides on our um, Yakima Nation lands. And so they're out there with shovels and hands and gloves and they, they pull as many weeds as they can, especially in culturally sensitive areas where our foods and medicines um, thrive. And we're teaching them about the impacts, about the forest densities, about the fire ecologies, and about our foods and medicines and our culture and our way of life. And so getting that younger generation to understand the challenges that they're going to be faced with um, so that they can uh, definitely take on those challenges in a better way. So again, this just shows um, our carbon footprint, if you will, as a timber 
tribe. Um, we started logging back in the late um, oh, 1940s, and it was more of a diameter cut, uh, thin from above, size it dies practice up until the the 1980s and our tribal membership, um, they wanted to be more cautious and leave more of the, you know, stronger, fire tolerant, um, atypical gra uh, crown for the feedstock. And so um, we looked at uh, thinning from below approach and with um, all the, you know, lack of disturbance and lack of fire, we had all that ingrowth that came in. And so we created a really good food chain, food ladder for Western spruce budworm. And that's what you can see um, the spikes in the 19, late 1990s through the 2000s. And we had a Western spruce budworm outbreak and we really brought down our, our carbon um, footprint. But now with um, how we look at our forest and you know, what's natural, what's not natural, what was happening pre-contact and the, the pine savanna, it's really difficult to get our, our membership to understand that our, our forests were more open. And so um, due to the, the fires we had on our forest, I think we've, we've burned over 50,000 acres in the last um, decade of our, you know, 600,000 acre forest. And, and um, a lot of it was in our commercial forest. So about you know, we took a a good 10, you know, 15% of um, production out of our forest from the mile marker 28 fire and the Cougar Creek fire. And so because of that, we were backing off our, our forestry activities, um, commercial activities, and that's the, the downscale there. Um, I am concerned as a forester that we might be setting ourselves up to, um, you know, having the the smaller trees and the growing sites um, stress out the larger trees and we'll be back to another epidemic that started our whole commercial timber base in the 1950s. And that was due to a Western pine butterfly um, outbreak that, uh, you know, killed a lot of our overstory ponderosa pine. Um, one thing that I do want to show about maintaining the infrastructure of the lumber mill, because what we're doing, and if you see in this slide and how we're only harvesting, you know, 20 million board feet off of our lands where we used to, you know, harvest over a hundred million board feet, um, our lumber mill cannot sustain that. And we need at least 60 to 70 million board feet a year. Um, and so we've had to go off reservation and buy timber cells there. There's been a lot of great work, you know, through Ryan Sanchi and Tribal Forest, our Tribal Forestry Program through Stewardship Contracting and Tribal Forest Protection Act um, that has allowed us to get off reservation timber cells. But um, there's cash flow constraints there. And um, we just need more um, opportunities that, um, you know, fit our milling needs. And our, our mill since 1980 um, has brought in over a billion, and that's with the B, um, local benefit, um, you know, through the jobs, through our payroll, our payroll's over $10 million a year to the 290 employees where we're in that capacity. But right now, just due to the economy, we're down to 190 employees. And so, you know, we've lost a third of our payroll that, you know, impacts our, our tribal community. 130 um, of those 190 people are tribal members. And so um, we've done census demographic analysis and there's about five to six family members um that that you know household income benefits from and so it, it ripples out through our our tribal um community and these are just uh for our milling uh, infrastructure you know looking for over the next 10 years over 120 million dollars of payroll um, over $70 million paying for the log itself to the Yakima Nation, $40 million to our loggers, 
and over you know 230 and that doesn't equate for the ripple effect and so once you you could times that times five or at least seven and so we're looking at another you know one and a half billion dollars of local benefit um to our economy and with carbon offsets and other activities that are happening within our forests, how is that going to play out? How are we going to monetize that value? Um, because if the trees do burn up, you're not able to um, use them as a carbon offset. And one thing that our mill has um, dealt with is that when they built it back in the 1990s and early 2000s, they made it very labor intensive. And so we have to deal with our um, automation and mill upgrades and technology upgrades, software upgrades. It's like a, like your cell phone, you know, we're, we're dealing with uh, one of your early model cell phones and everybody's on, you know, their I, iPhone, whatever we're at 14, 15 now. And so they're the technical support to um, uphold that software programming is just not there. And so we need to make a major investment in our in our lumber mill. We will be losing jobs to automation with that, but we're trying to offset it with other economic opportunities with um, cut up plants, finger joining, um, molding, um, other processing, biochar, housing manufacturing, and other things that would be more responsible to um, getting more value out of our logs. And if, if uh, we can get biochar going, that would definitely be help with um, the carbon footprint and sequestration of, uh, you know, our local area. And then I didn't get a chance to hear Brad's um, presentation, but he's one of our, our big customers. And this was a project that, you know, we worked with um, Sustainable Northwest and getting, you know, into the Portland airport. And there's going to be actually videos. So if you go to the airport um, after January, you could be able to watch our story. But one thing that we're doing is we're trying to um, find partners that are willing to share and value what we do, how we do it, and our stories and work with the architects and the engineers and developers so that um, we could potentially put some type of premium on our on our lumber products and um, share that you know we're locally owned grown um, sustainable stewards uh, tribal and it's a you know it's a high valued product uh, we're constantly told that you know we produce um, some of the best lumber in the world and we want to share that with the world and our top customers um, from Marvin Windows to Brightwood. And then, you know, as we work with Prime Forest, they we serve um, VLUX out of South Carolina. And, um, you know, we're not quite sole source to them, but we do definitely a majority of their, their lumber um, volume that goes through there. And so, you know, we're tied to um, other businesses in a big way. They rely on us. And so us keeping going, our forest management practices, our infrastructure, our milling infrastructure, um, providing our lumber products um, within the, you know, reservation and off the reservation is very important, not just to us, but others. And then certification, I don't know if Brad um, was able to speak to that much, but we are SFI certified and PF cert PFC certified, and we're potentially looking at FSC certified. And, um, this is the FSC team that came out with us on our reservation and looked at, um, and with certification comes third party our auditors. I know as a tribe, um, we always share, you know, it's well, it's, it's nice that the industry finally caught up with us and our best management practices, because we've, we've been working this way um, for a very long time. And we value, you know, the resource, the water, the air quality, the habitat, the foods, the medicines. And um, it's just, I wish there was a way for us to get that value without having to pay for it. Um, but it's just, you know, the way the industry standard is. And so we'll continue to, to pay to play, um, but people do visit us and, um, we do share what we do. And so I would invite any of the participants in this um, conference, if they do want to come take a tour of the Akama Reservation, our practices, you're, you're more than welcome. Please contact us. 
um, to, you know, because I know going through Zoom and slideshows just doesn't, it doesn't quite hit us home as much and um, our way of life. And um, it definitely is a way of life. We see our, our foods and our medicines, the water, the roots, the berries, the, the deer and the elk that we, um, that sacrifice their lives for us to sustain ourselves the these trees the ponderosa pine the douglas fir and the grand fir they're no different and um we have to take honor and respect it it's a delicate precious gift and you um have to you know take care of it that way so that it'll be there for many many more generations um and in climate change and carbon influxes and outfluxes um play a you know vital role in that so i want to thank you and again uh, thank, you know, Ryan Sanchi and Brad Rodakowski for making themselves available and for you being patient um, with me. Thank you so much, Steve. We really appreciate it. Um, although it was in a different order than we uh, had expected, I hope, I hope for all of you, you were able to see the relationship in one presentation from forest management uh, to first and second uh, producers. Um, we have a bunch of questions coming in. I think we only really have time for probably uh, one, maybe two. Um, this is a, uh, an anonymous question. Uh, is the Yakima Nation working with any mass timber or cross laminate timber producers, or is the Yakima Nation developing its own mass timber production capacity? The, the simple answer is yes and yes. Um, we've... Uh working with um, a couple projects for Central Washington University, also working on a project with uh, Hewitt Packard. And I think there's another one that we're working on. And there's actually more interest in going to um, those spaces. And then there was also a uh, Climate Smart um, infrastructure dollar grant that um, a company is working with us to uh, bring in uh, cross laminated timbers operations at the mill. And so, yes. Thank you. Uh, and one last question. Uh, this is from Jack McDonald at the Lancis Fund. We noted that the Yakima Nation received a Department of Ecology grant towards investigating a forest carbon offset project on its lands. Uh, has there been progress on identifying a potential project? Do you want to answer that, Ryan? Yeah, so um, we did uh, get the grant and we are doing a, um, uh, we are in, in development of a possible project um, on our fee lands, which we will take to our leadership and they will make that decision. So right now it's, um, taken to our leadership and we are waiting for a decision to be made by them. That's all I can um, say at this time. And thank you, Steve and Ryan and Brad for taking the time to present and be part of the conference today. Unfortunately, that is uh, all the time we have for this session. So we're gonna take a five minute break and uh, be back at 3.05 for our presentation from Microsoft. Thanks again.